What's up, guys? Ron from Ronald Ray Law. And in today's interview, we're talking with Michael Hughesby, who is an investments and securities attorney. Specifically, we're going to talk about how to raise money and what the impact of today's economy is doing to capital raising in the future. So, Michael, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. But if you want to just give us your background, you're, you're active on X. So I started my career at a law firm called Latham & Watkins, and I did all sorts of corporate stuff. So capital markets, you know, stock and bond offerings. I did some fund formation there as well. A long story short, um, I, I learned I have this disease where I'm going blind while I was at Latham, and I decided I wanted to do something else for a little bit. So I basically moved to South America and had about a year outside the US. So I actually called a lawyer who I used to work with at Latham. Uh, you know, I like investment funds, want to help people out. So many lawyers are just really risk averse and they don't have the same thought process of our clients who are out there taking risk and making bets and, and, and using the law as a tool. But so many lawyers just deal in a, you know, kind of an academic theoretical vacuum of, so it, it's, it's great, you know, that you're a real estate investor. And for this call, I really want to focus on you know, Reg D, obviously 506 mm -hmm. offerings are, are very popular for single asset. Yep. Uh, and then maybe a little bit of compare and contrast against a fund formation. And then finally, I, I want to really pick your brain. And I'm super curious about this answer, which is what are the GPs or response? What are the consequences? Are they going to get sued? And, and will those LPs mm -hmm. win anything? Keys are going back to lenders. Pro formas are wildly inaccurate. Or maybe if they didn't buy rate caps, is that per se negligence fraud? Is there any liability basically for GPs? If you can yeah. remember all that, start wherever you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wait, where, where did we start? That was a lot of questions. People doing fund raises in 2024, it's very different than when you were raising money in 2021. So so Reg D is, is the law that pretty much all of our clients use to be exempt from registering securities with the SEC. So as a general rule, if you're going to sell securities, and that includes, you know, an investment fund, it includes single asset, you know, SPVs or syndications, if you're going to sell securities, you either have to register with the SEC, which is like an IPO, or find an exemption. So pretty much nobody in the investment fund space does an IPO. And so the exemption that pretty much all of our clients use is called Regulation D. And there's two flavors to Regulation D. One is called 506B. And my stupid little thing is I call it 506 Be Quiet, just so you remember, like you can't talk about it. You can't talk about fundraising. And what does that really mean? So it's 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 kind of squishy. There's no like list that the SEC put out that's like you can say this, but you can't say this. It's basically just like don't make it sound like you're fundraising. So you could say, like, oh, like I like apartment buildings. This is what I think is good about apartment buildings, but nothing that makes it sound like you're fundraising. So that includes specific deal saying, I have something under contract, uh, we're raising equity, we're raising yeah. this. I, I, I see the better sponsors, probably at the advice of the lawyer saying, contact me. They're really about um, inbound where it says, contact me if you're interested, contact me if you wanna learn more versus, hey, this is a 10 pref, this is a nine pref. Yeah, definitely don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely don't talk about about really anything that you're even like specifically doing that's that's talking about fundraising. You want to be very, very careful. Uh, so there's another option, which is is newer. It's about a decade old called 506C. And 506C is like kind of a public private hybrid sort of thing where you can speak publicly about fundraising. So that's super helpful. You can post on Twitter, you can post on LinkedIn, you can you can go on podcasts, you can take out advertisements, you know, you can do all sorts of things. So um, obviously that's good. So what's what's kind of the drawback? The drawback is in a 506 B quiet option, um, you know, you can have up to 35 non-accredited investors and you, the, as, me, as many accredited investors as you want. And to, to see whether they're accredited, you just ask them. You send them a questionnaire, you say, are you accredited? They say, yes. You say, good, you know, you're done. 
So that's this the has come full yeah. circle. The the self accreditation has come full circle, right? Because I've been I've been practicing for almost fifteen years. In the beginning, it was like that too for accreditation, self accreditation, and then they added legal lawyer and CPAs, and you know there there's all these third party um, companies. Yeah. So so five hundred six B that option, um, it's self accreditation, and okay. so the difference is for five hundred six C, you do have to do all those things you just mentioned. Oh, I see. So, okay. so uh, if you're five hundred six C, you can speak publicly, uh, but everyone you raise from has to be accredited, and you have to have them prove that they're accredited somehow. And the ways that they prove it are exactly what you just mentioned. So we have like a form letter that they send to their lawyer, CPA, whatever, that just says, you know, this investor is accredited. And then we say, okay, that's fine. We don't have to do anything more than that. And then there are lots of third party services like Verify Investor, Invest Ready. There's all sorts of things with names like that where uh, investors basically upload some documents to a electronic service provider and then they spit out a letter that says, yep, they're accredited. So the trade off here is 506B is good because it's easier to do. You just have people self certify that they're accredited. And 506C is better because you can speak publicly. So if you think you can raise the whole fund or the whole deal with 506B, you might as well do it that way because there's less friction. And if you think, you know, if you have a big social media presence, for example, you might want to go 506C because then you can reach a wider audience. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it. I, I do think there is a impression in the market, uh, whether it's true or not, that C is for unsophisticated operators. Um, rightly or wrongly, I think that's the perception. And so I, I know a lot of investors say, I won't invest if it's a C offering because of the perceived low quality of the GP's network. But they will do, they will look at a B because it gives them a higher confidence of the operator's existing network and maybe past deals. So investors roll over and just a little bit of track record that, hey, I have the confidence to do a, a 506B. Yeah, that that makes sense. I, I like at least in my experience, I think that stigma is kind of going away, and I think it really gets to the network and the track record, which, which are really you know the most yeah. important, the most important parts. Well, let's talk about actual numbers because yeah. in in my world, I would say that my equity raises are five million and below. That's mm -hmm. that's what we kind of cut cut off. You know, it's got to be a million, a minimum of a million or two million, but five to yeah. two, and then five to ten is kind of that threshold. What's what's an ideal client that you think justifies DLA's pr pricing? I mean, I know you guys yeah. are you're a great law firm, you're a great attorney, but just candidly, like, what would yeah. you want to raise to say that it's worth it to spend? I don't know. What do you guys try like 100k for a raise yeah. or 50k uh, for a raise? Yeah, it, it totally depends on the exact nature of the raise. Um, so for example, something like a single asset deal might be in the 15 to 20k range. Um, so you're, that's pretty market. I mean, that I would say that's competitive. I, I have been spending a lot of time making a very streamlined, efficient process. So okay. I can mostly because honestly, because like I meet so many people on Twitter. And I want to be able to work with them. And so I kind of just, you know, I can't charge 50K for an SPV, you know? So so I really want to like make it, I, I've made it very like, you know, efficient and mechanized, you know, very repeatable, uh, getting some automation involved uh, so we can lower costs. It's something that's, that's great. Very important. I mean, I think you should lead with that on the call because again, me as somebody who prices these things out and I see them on my clients, right? We do the, we do the dirt work. We'll do the title, yeah. PSA and all that. And then, but I see your invoices and I know what the capital stack kind of looks like. And that's super competitive. I mean, that's right in line with, I won't say like a solo, but that's in line with the smaller shops that do a lot of volume or specialized security. Yeah. And so I think you should lead with that because I definitely thought you were going to have sticker shock with zeros um, <laughs> because of the name, you know, you guys are yeah. a firm. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, and then for a fund, you know, this really depends on, on a variety of factors, but medians usually around 50 K. Yeah. Uh, and the thing that in real estate specifically, um, you have to think about is there's, there's two levers, two main levers that will affect your pricing. Uh, so one is your LPs. 
Who are the LPs and where are they and what type of LP are they? So if you just have like people like you and me who are just you know individual humans residing in the United States, that is the easiest. That's no problem. Um, but if you have either uh, tax exempt investors, so non humans like university endowments or pensions or things of that nature, you have to do a lot of extra structuring to accommodate them. Same thing with, with individuals or institutions outside of the United States. Uh, there's basically these types of income that real estate throws off. Um, if you're playing at home, they're called UBTI and ECI. And these types of income are things that these investors don't want. So you basically, you have to set up fancy structures to protect those investors. And that those fancy structures cost more. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And then um, would you say a big part of the cost too is the negotiation? Because that was absolutely, yeah, <laughs> that was number two. The negotiation is is yeah. more important because if there's a lot of funds and, and syndications, I, I by the way, for terminology, I, I'll say SPVs. That's what I say, but it's syndications. So those are the same thing. It's like one asset and then funds are multiple assets. Um, but yes. Like a fund might be 50K, but like we, we've had funds where, and these are big funds, um, where like the formation and everything was 50K and then the final bill is like 400K because like we had like the specific one is like Sequoia put in $30 million and in the negotiation process, they sent us a 30 page like <laughs> checklist like yeah. just <laughs> list of complaints you know and then like we go back and forth multiple times and then i guess this is like one important thing to note about negotiations for for funds or spvs is there's two types of ways you can negotiate one is you change the agreement for all of the investors involved mm. so you change the limited partnership agreement the operating agreement whatever you're calling it and it applies to all investors. So you could lower the management fee fund wide from, for example, 2% to 1.5%. Yep. The other option is you make a special deal with just one LP. And you say, like, okay, like Sequoia, you're coming in for $30 million. We are going to reduce the fee just for you from 2% to 1.5%. And that special deal is called a side letter. Yeah, side letter agreement, side, well, then you can get into side car where if they start wanting right, to that's a different thing. returns, yeah. then yeah. you create a different vehicle for them to invest in. And yeah, I, I think the point of it is that the permutations are almost infinite. And when yeah. you're dealing at the fund level with more sophisticated LPs, they have very specific ideas about incentives and risk and different exposures. And then they yeah. have their own motivations. But, um, you know, in terms of the cost of the, the capital, it's still probably in the single digits in terms of the total race, including, you know, as other far parts. as, as far as From like the sponsor, legal, no like total, a, total oh, yeah, yeah. equity raise for the yeah. whole fund, you know, yeah, yeah. deal cost. you say it's 400 K, but it's, you know, they're raising a hundred million. Right. Um, and so it's it's all relative and then there's a lot of strategy it sounds like if you're the sponsor about okay do we even want sequoia to put money in because we know they're going to send us a 30 page list of requirements we yeah. could raise um 30 million from five smaller lps that only send us a one page requirement there's still requirements and still changes but yeah. which one is better how many how many counterparties do you want to deal with and um what what are your options so it's it really sounds like when you're at that level where you need somebody on your securities team that has been through multiple permutations yeah you could really give good advice you know my scenario exactly like hey ron we've got one great lp but they're really needy and you know they're gonna they're gonna rake us through the coals <laughs> yeah. do we have the option to raise a smaller amount from more lps that are still going to have their own counsel and still have changes but they might be more manageable changes that are yeah. to your point fund-wide changes because those lps are similarly situated and we just make wholesale changes that might be easier and faster uh than going with one partner that gets to write the script and 
you know, again, 30 million on a hundred million, they still might be the biggest LP that dictates what they want. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, you bring up like a lot of good considerations here. Um, Cause one is if you have a big LP, they might want all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, like in some instances, in, in many instances, the biggest LP will also want to be in the GP. Yeah. So they'll say, you know, I'll put in a bunch of money, but give us 10% of the carried interest from the fund or, or something of that nature. And that gets very complicated. Um, so, and then on the other side, you know, more investors is, is good to some extent because then you're, you're diversified in your capital base, but you also don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole because right. you don't, you don't want to like have a hundred million dollar fund with a bunch of like hundred thousand dollar checks, <laughs> for example. <You laughs> There's know, a lot of work compliance. It's a lot of cats to herd, a lot of K1s to go out. Um, a lot of know, lawyers, it, you know, a lot like, of lawyers. At, at that Although level, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'll say even at that level, maybe not 100K checks, but if you do a million dollar checks, every one of those people are going to have their own counsel and they may or may not yeah. be good counsel, but they're going to have lawyers and it just makes your job that much more difficult um, to herd those legal cats. Because if you want to <laughs> yeah. distinguish, right, once we're talking about these levels of clients, everybody has, everybody is represented, but not all representation is the same. And that's where it can be really frustrating to try to push deals through because you're not just dealing from client to client. It's the lawyer to lawyer relationship. So yeah, totally. And like kind of what you mentioned at the beginning of the call is a lot of lawyers, I, I find kind of focus on things that don't matter at all. And it just it just bogs down the process. So I think it's important to focus on material terms that actually move the needle and focus on, you know, in some cases, absolute nonsense. Like some some lawyers on Twitter posts like, you know, all the opposing counsel's only comments were like putting extra spaces after periods and like changing straight co quotes to curly quotes. And it's just like absolutely you know, insane. <laughs> you know? That's just uh, some fee like, padding there. That's just that insane. is that is fee padding. It's no good. Yeah. Um, well, that that's a great direction. Um, I really want to get your opinion on the other stuff, but I have a question that came yeah. up. You know, there's been a lot of chatter, and there's been some proposed congressional legislation about eliminating or or greatly reducing a credit investor. Which camp are you in? And, and I'll lay this out a little bit more. The legislation basically, are you familiar with this, by the way? Have you? I mean, I've seen, I, I don't know if I know the exact legislation you're talking about, because there's been a few things recently. Yeah, this so, is the so most which one? iteration, basically yeah. saying, we want to uh, democratize these private investments and, and the government is creating a barrier which simultaneously reduces access to these two, three, five X right. equity multiple deals from. Yep. People who, I don't know, I don't want to, I won't use accredited, I won't use sophisticated because that's actually a legal term too. It's people that could make this decision, but lack the, some of the black and white, you know, the income or the net yep. worth minus primary and, you know, maybe not sophisticated, but they're trying to create this little carve out versus hey these are risky investments um the government is going to field a bunch of angry taxpayer losses we're going to have more <laughs> criminals out there preying yeah. on you know un unworthy people just by nature of the deal and it's the government's role to look out for these people so we should create it w what's your take i mean that's essentially i did a yeah. poor job of describing but should these investments be available to everyone or maybe a some kind of simple test or do you think that these limits or or barriers serve a valid public interest yeah i mean it is i i on this one i come down somewhere in the middle um you know there's there's definitely people who say like you know take the gloves off you know everybody just do your own diligence i, I think we've seen instances like that go up in smoke, go up in flames um, a lot. So I do think there should be some sort of protections, but I, I like personally the idea of just like having some sort of test that's that doesn't require, I mean, so just as a little bit of background, they did change the rules somewhat recently, allowing for certain licensed professionals, such as Lawyer. series seven um, and such to, 
be accredited investors. But that's like a lot of, there's a lot of hoops to jump through to get like your series seven, for example. So personally, I mean, I, you know, unfortunately, you know, Gensler doesn't call me and ask me about my opinions on these sorts of things. Um, but I like the idea of having some sort of test where you can just take the test, you know, it's online or whatever, you know, it might have to be somewhat difficult, but, um, you know, to show you have some financial literacy, uh, because yeah, sometimes like, you know, if you make $195,000 a year for 20 years in a row, you're still not an accredited investor. Well, right. I guess you could, you could, if you're, net worth. If you're you net could worth. earn the net worth, but, but, but it excludes, excludes your primary, primary house. Yeah, you know? exactly. So, so maybe he has no mortgage, but then somebody else that has 95%, you know, debt on their primary, but they have other brokerage funds that are less. It, it's a very weird test looking yeah. at net worth, excluding primary in that regard. And to your point, it sounds like, I don't really think those income, uh, you know, because again, that also favors people that live in California over people that live in Alabama, even though the financial literacy is almost just the most important thing is, do you understand risk? Do you understand how to interpret uh, or distinguish between marketing versus disclosures and the legal documents? Because that's probably the best test. If you ask somebody, Hey, I'm going to give you $100,000 for this Reg D offering. You yeah. ask the, the test is, does that GP have a legal requirement to give it back to you? And a lot of people, I think, would say yes. Like, I gave you the money to invest. Maybe I don't make profit, but you owe it back to me. <laughs> yeah. I think, and this is just me speculating yeah. based on, you know, Main Street Diner. I think they would say, yeah, he has to give it back to me, but maybe he doesn't have to give me profit. And, it, and yeah. it doesn't have a timeline, but the, they also get confused, I think, on a five-year term, which is just kind of a, a suggestion, right? I mean, t there's the five-year fund life or the, yeah. the raise life is just an expected kind of thing. Um, yeah. But on the financial literacy, you could literally ask them that if the documents say it's a five-year, does that mean you get your money back at, in five years? And yeah. a lot of people, I think, will be like, yes. That's yeah. my understanding. That's an interesting, yeah. It's an interesting concept. I guess I've been in this world so long that that just seems bizarre that somebody would think that. But you know, you're probably right. Uh, I mean, maybe that should go on the test. You know, you, you you have to check some boxes that say like you understand that you know in these private investments you can lose all your money. I mean, yeah. it says that all over the place in the offering documents, but nobody reads it. You know, yeah, just, just <laughs> nobody reads it. But are you saying they, nobody reads my writing? I, I worked so hard. <laughs> I read it. Oh, I would be the only one because I can bill for it. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a very interesting question to me, just philosophically in terms of you know what do you view the role of government? Because there's so many con men, there's so many fraudsters chomping at the bit for yeah. the next financial product to pray. And and again, like they they have a ton of opportunity even without delving into securities law but they try to stay low they try to stay legal um taking the money i i don't know i did a uh, yeah. an interview with a, a journalist about people that are uh, recycling land so they sell you this home site homestead mm -hmm. and you put minimal amounts down and you make payments but then once you miss a payment they foreclose and take the land back and so they basically have this subdivision which is being constantly sold and foreclosed on endlessly weird where yeah. is it just out of it's curiosity in texas. it's in it's, in it's uh, like outside of houston but interesting so their business model is to just to like take interest payments and then foreclose and then start over yeah they i think they take a little down payment too yeah um to cover their ex, you know extra judicial foreclosure non-judicial foreclosure but yeah that's the kind of stuff i would say it's perfectly legal but yeah, yeah. they 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 target or their main demographic is like hispanic spanish speakers so people that maybe don't have good access to credit uh don't really read the english legal documents because they don't understand it but they have fifteen hundred dollars for a down payment and then they have this huge subdivision of 500 lots yeah and they say like pick your house but anyway i don't, I don't want to go down that path too much um <laughs> but it's it is interesting that i think people will always find a way to scheme or con uh, it's been going on for millennia <laughs> you know <laughs> you're totally right um all right so we've gone through the 
SPV. Um, by the way, do you call it single S, single vehicle, uh, or a special purpose vehicle? Single we, purpose or special? We just call it special purpose vehicle. Special. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, I, right. I won't I make other people say both. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've gone through that difference for the Reg D, Reg D yeah. 506B, 506C. Uh, I've talked about some of the differences between a fund versus those SPV raises. What is your opinion now on these GPs who give the keys back to lenders? Are they susceptible? I mean, certainly it's America. You can sue anybody for anything. Are they going to win? I mean, so this, to me, this gets down to like, what is securities fraud? Because securities fraud is, is what most of this is. Um, so if you just like, if you do what you said you were going to do, and it just happens to be that, you know, interest rates got jacked up, you can't make interest payments and the thing failed. Like most, most investors know, well, that was a risk, you know, it didn't work out. And, and that's kind of the end. What a lot of people, a lot of GPs did, which I think will get them in trouble is, is one of two things. So first of all, and it's all securities based. I mean, that's the lens I look through. So that, you know, that's kind of the- well, I think that's the biggest yeah. gun that, that, that should yeah. be, right? So it needs to yeah. be a federal action where they've raised a lot of money and it gets the attention of AUSAs. Uh, I, I don't think there are any state court actions, right? For the viewers, that's basically the two arenas you're looking at, either federal prosecution or state prosecution for statutory crimes. Maybe you could have some civil stuff thrown in, but that's small yeah. potatoes. The stuff yeah. that gets the GP's attention would be a federal securities fraud case facing multiple felonies, wire fraud, and you know, you're looking at 60 years in jail, but or prison. You're looking at 60 years in prison. So sorry, just to clarify, <laughs> that's your lens, but I think it's the most important stick, yeah, so to speak, because the other stuff is not gonna raise the attention of local prosecutors. Yeah, yeah. So I should say I'm not a litigator. So I, I, I'm not an expert in litigation. Uh, but my job is to basically, you know, when I represent GPs is, is to prevent things like this from happening. So, um, you know, there's there's two basic lenses. So first of all, first of all, it's important to note that people get sued when you lose money. You know, if, if, if you're making money, nobody cares. The investors like, oh, you know, like investors don't care whether you're following securities laws. If they're making money so there's two there's two you know big ways that you can be violating securities laws one is you're speaking publicly about raising money but you didn't do the 506c uh verifying accreditation procedure so what you've done now is sell unregistered securities without an exemption in many cases, obviously the facts will differ. So basically you, you screwed up, <laughs> you mm -hmm. screwed up and normally investors aren't going to care. Investors aren't even going to know, like they don't know the securities laws, but if you put in a million dollars and it all goes, goes up in smoke, you're going to hire a litigator and the litigator is going to know about this exemption that I just talked about. And that will be one of the things probably that, that they will you know bring up in a lawsuit. The other thing, um, which is at least as common, I think, is, is just securities fraud. So what securities fraud is, is you know when you raise money, you, you might have a deck, you might have a PPM, you might have all sorts of stuff that you send out. All of that is, is saying, you know, we're gonna do something. And if you say we're gonna do something, and then in practice, you don't do it, that that is essentially securities fraud. So if, if the investors all think, I mean, like as kind of a ridiculous case, if it's like, oh, like we're gonna buy an apartment building and instead you buy a boat, like that's securities fraud. But there's and that's an obvious one that I don't know. I don't know how often that well, how about within commercial real yeah. estate? Because yeah, yeah, I do see a lot of GPs, um, and again, this is maybe more on the fun side, but they try to hedge and say, we might buy industrial, we might buy multifamily, uh, we may even find you know a, a retail shopping center if the price is yeah. good. And for funds, it's a little bit better, but I also think at some point they're so broad that it doesn't it doesn't hold water. You can't say on the fund, we're gonna buy anything that is you know real property that 
doesn't seem like it would be a sufficient disclaimer. Yeah. So I actually think that as far as like from a lawsuit perspective, that what you described is probably actually the safest for GPs. Um, so, so like if you say we're going to buy, you know, let's just like kind of like take it, take it to the inversion just to see how, how this might work. If you say like, we're going to buy a property at one, two, three main street and you raise money and then you don't buy that and you buy something else, that's almost certainly securities fraud. Well, that's because, what happened with Eli yeah. Schwartz. I mean, yeah. I'm, are you familiar with the Nightingale saga? I mean, it's a lot of drama, but he raised money for two office building purchases and he mm -hmm. didn't close. He didn't return the equity. He YOLO'd in on some First Republic stock when it was at like 20 cents and then he lost 9 million. Uh, but he lost 80 Wait, million. That's what happened? I haven't been following that very oh, closely. Okay, well, check Wait. out my YouTube channel. I've got two Wait. videos. He, um, he said he was going to buy Office Towers and he bought First Republic stock? Yeah. That is an... With okay, I mean, if that's, if that's like, I obviously don't know... Um, like, I don't know anything about that, but if that's something that somebody did, that is an excellent case. Like if I were, so, you know, some sort of prosecutor, uh, or some sort of like plaintiff's attorney, I, I would be very excited about taking on that case. Yeah. It's, it's a very curious one too, because he, he also then made a proposed class action settlement where he would pay back their equity, something like, you know, uh, quarterly payments at 5% interest for the next three years. And this guy, the, the principal is weird because he's still standing behind it. Um, he's got, you know, substantial like net worth. He's, he's putting up his, his penthouse condo, which is legitimate in New York. You know, it's worth $20 million, but he lost 80 million. And so he's saying that he's going to sell some of his other properties, take that equity, use it to fund these repayment schedules. All the while, he's he's probably facing down some criminal prosecutions, which haven't obviously uh, surfaced yet, but they're definitely coming. But he's got yeah. this civil thing, which is very public. Um, he used one of the crowdfunding sites like mm -hmm. CrowdStreet or, Crowd or Street. Real Crowd. Well, they all have Real, Crowd in their name. Real yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, they didn't vet the money, you know, like once the fund was closed on their website, they yeah. just transferred the money to the sponsor like a couple of yeah. days before closing. And then they said, that's our practice. Uh, yeah. They've never transferred directly to the escrow agent. They just give it to the sponsor. Yeah. Interesting. So like, wow, that's that's really that's really quite the story. I mean, so in this in this situation, you know, even if like a, a sponsor like this put all the money into First Republic stock, and then it like went up, like that would still be securities fraud, you know? Um, so interesting, interesting. So yeah, as a sponsor, as a, you, you don't want to do something that you said you weren't going to do. And if you are going to do something, you should do it. So I guess going back to our, our example a minute ago is, you know, as a lawyer, part of what we do when we look at, um, you know, decks or, or business sections of the PPM for clients, is is we hedge we basically what we take we just water down the language you know uh, and it makes it slightly less compelling you know from like a if you read it it's like it doesn't have quite the same amount of you know oomph, it doesn't have as much punch but it's because you know you don't actually really know what's going to happen in the future so like you know it'll say like we will buy something that will have a cash on cash of 12% or something. And we say, no, 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 no. <laughs> you can't say that. Um, you could say like you intend to, or something of that projected. nature. Yeah. Yeah. Projected, or this is our, this is our strategy. Um, but it's because, you know, you don't want to say you're going to do something like you will do it. And then you end up can't doing it, you know, like that might be something that investors will get upset about. And, and then sue for. Uh, yeah, so how granular does it go though? Because let's talk about debt. You know, we talked a little yeah. bit about saying that a, an important part of our multifamily purchase strategy is to buy rate caps, or we intend to buy rate caps, or we intend to use fixed rate debt. Yeah. What, what if you say those types of things, we intend to use it, but you you don't do that at all, um, I mean, I guess it's it's something that looks like it's out of your control, but it's outside the scope of either saying we intend to use fixed rate 
debt and then and then you know you put some exotic private money lender i i don't know i'm just yeah. trying to think how what happens if the lawyers dilute it within this box but then an event occurs out here that i don't say nobody could foresee but yeah. it just was outside the dilution range yeah i mean it's a good question you know obviously in the last few years there have been market conditions that few could have <laughs> um you know forecasted um the real answer is like when we're getting into like you know what what if it was here but then you go like slightly over here that that's you know that's going to be basically resolved by a court and, and, so there and will be litigation so what i'm taking be. away is yeah I, I think if if the lps lost money they're gonna sue and it's going to be resolved between the lawyers because there's at least a good enough of a chance do these lawyers take these securities cases on contingency um sometimes i'm not i'm not an expert on on what exactly the litigators yeah. are up to and, and and i guess like i would say from you know my my job is keep the gp from getting sued so like on my list of things you know to kind of prevent this scenario that we're talking about from happening like first is make the language in the offering documents flexible so always change it to intends expects whatever second of all you know be open with your lps all the time you know if if if, if it looks like oh like like first of all everybody knows that the fed jacked up interest rates you know it's it's not a surprise but but if you say you you should be sending you know quarterly updates or or something like that to your lps like this is what we're seeing um you know lps will understand if if things change that are outside your control they just want to see you know what you guys like how are you thinking about it how are you dealing with it you could say like well we thought we were going to do you know floating rate debt or fixed rate debt or whatever and but like now market conditions are such that you know it doesn't make sense and this is why we think that we're going to try something else and what lps don't want is that and i hear this sort of thing all the time which is crazy it's just like you know you give the gp money they didn't respond to emails for like three years until they ask for a capital call <laughs> you know and it's like <laughs> that is no good but i get that question a lot is yeah uh, you say quarterly updates which is great but do they have a legal remedy if they don't even send annual updates it it depends on it, it kind of depends on a few things so so first of all by law for most like real estate syndicators or or small fund managers that are or, or even larger fund managers that are only doing real estate like dirt and buildings and things like that there's not typically a a law that says that they have to give certain reporting this this to the members of the the LP to the LPs, lps to the lps now there's there's first of all there's there's a law called the investment advisors act which applies to all sorts of funds and single asset vehicles um typically not real estate though unless the real estate fund is doing things like like buying securities or uh taking being like a passive partner in a jv or, or something like that. yeah like a fund of funds exactly yeah. a fund of funds there's, for there's sure a fair amount, there's a fair yes. number of those around so i don't want to say it's zero but yeah so a fund of funds will be subject to the, the advisors uh, act advisors yeah. Act, yeah depending on how much assets under management they have mm. um but yes yes but so but most real estate you know vehicles will not but um you know mo almost, i mean every vehicle that we raise has some sort of contractual reporting requirement even so, like on an annual basis yeah it depends it depends on you know the size of the vehicle like in our you know section 11.3 of our fund documents um you know typically says you'll get quarterly financials unaudited um and then you'll get annual statements uh, audited, and then you'll get K ones. I mean, that's that's kind of the standard suite. And what's the remedy if the GP doesn't do that? It's just I mean, it's a breach, uh, but... breach of contract. I mean, it's it's you know that that's the action. <laughs> you know, you'll have to call your your litigator friends to see exactly what yeah. they think about uh, you know how that would shake out. Um, but the idea is, you know, like if if the if the investors are hurt. By the fact that they're not getting these reports then then they 
could have some sort of you know colorable action to sue yeah and i think so the the ones that i've kind of done too if you're an lp listening to this and you haven't gotten updates and you think it's a contractual requirement i think it may be a statutory requirement um so you can make a demand upon the manager for books and records is like this is at least in texas so if i'm a member of an llc i can make a demand to the manager for books and records mm -hmm. uh, at any time no more than annually to get certain documents that's a member statutory right ah, okay but yeah. combined with the contractual provisions of the ppm or the the operating agreement that they sign what it does is if it's a breach you just get attorney's fees so it's if, if it ends up you get all the information at the end but you've had to hire an attorney if because it's a breach if you have a prevailing party provision you can yeah. just get your attorney's fees so that it's not out of pocket for you to enforce your legal right but if it's not a right you know if you overstep your demand of like i want to see leases i want to see a copy of the property and I'm like well you're not entitled to that yeah you're just getting financials and now we've we've sent those to you you just get the attorney's fees for that, not that portion. Um, that's my experience with it, but it's been dealing again with Texas statutory. Um, and again, I'm not sure if other states have the same or as strong uh, member protections. So. Yeah. So most most of the, the funds and SPVs we set up are limited partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit different. And in Delaware, which is where basically everything we form is, uh, whether it be an LLC or a limited partnership, there there is like a you you can kind of like waive some of the information Unfair, rights. Yeah. Uh, so that's something you know. Look for that in the in the LLC <laughs> agreement, um, because that that can you know you could be make them called like an economic assignee or something. You basically give them some less information rights. So it's, it's it. something that can be done in Delaware at least. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, that's, that's, it's been a great call. I, I think there's a lot of uh, content for people to unpack how to understand how to raise capital for real estate in 2024 with all of this in mind, LPs are, are gun shy, but they're going to be trigger happy. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of lawsuits uh, again, a vast majority yeah. of those will be settled. They'll get dismissed, but that doesn't stop the fact of the LPs. If you lose money, and they have more money to throw. Yeah, I say it's good money after bad, but these are deep pocket investors. I think people also really don't realize just because somebody cut you a 250K check, if they've got 5 million more liquid, they don't hesitate to throw 50K at a lawsuit to cause you pain. Uh, they the might GP. also just be mad. Yeah, yeah, to cause you pain. Yeah, they might yeah. just be vindictive, which is which is reasonable based on some of this cheap behavior. <laughs> so you you you've really got to understand what you're going to do if you're raising capital and not raise capital in the old ways because we're in a new economic reality and LPs are are are, are dangerous when you lose their money. So <laughs> yeah, for sure, for uh, sure. Yeah, how can people find you, Michael? What's the best way to get in contact? uh yeah on on twitter it's uh investing underscore law i'm at michael bjorn hughesby on linkedin and the investments lawyer on youtube all right well i'll drop links for all of those profiles down below but thanks so much for joining and uh we'll, we'll see you online all right thank you sir i appreciate it